Glad to have you here on this Monday night of our New Life meeting. And we can talk about new life because we have new life in Him, saved by the blood. And uh, I tell you what, if God can give you eternal life, there's nothing too big for Him. I mean, that's it. That's everything. And I, tonight, let's come with a holy optimism of what God can do. Dr. Shaw, you want to make your way up here? I've got to make you pray from up here because of the live stream. It's always good to have Dr. Shaw with us. What a blessing he was uh, for a number of years here in the early days of our college and, of course, for our church and academy. And uh, we're thankful for his good ministry. What are you teaching this round? Personal finance. Personal finance. That's always a great blessing. Good to have you with us. Lead us in prayer, if you would. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you. We praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, our Savior, and Lord, for the blood that was shed for our sins. And thank you that we are saved by that blood, by grace through faith. Thank you for the service tonight. We do pray you'll bless it, Lord. May we sense your presence here this evening. May you anoint Brother Jim with the power to preach your word, Lord. We pray that the Holy Spirit would fill him. We pray, Lord, that we'd have tender hearts and sensitive spirits as the word of God is preached, as the Holy Spirit works. And Lord, as you convict and move in our midst, may we respond and do what you would lead us to do if there's a need in our heart here tonight. So Lord, bless, and we'll commit this service to you tonight. But we ask it in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Amen. I'm glad tonight that that's what my Savior did for me. He washed it white as snow. Please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 129. Hymn number 129. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Let's stand again, please, focusing on the blood and the cross. 129. before we sing the chorus each time, really do paint a picture of how bad our sin is, don't they? Crimes. The next verse here, while might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in, when Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. Let me encourage you tonight to ask the Lord to help you see your sin for what it is, but then also to see his blood for what it can do. And what it has done, obviously, in, in cleansing your sin and you know that your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west, but we also need that daily cleansing from the Lord, making sure that our hearts are right with God. So I trust that we'll have the right view of sin tonight and also rejoice in the, in the glorious cleansing. Let's sing on, on the third, Well Might the Sun. Well might the sun. great to see you here on this Labor Day, and it's great to have a revival meeting on Labor Day, and I'm glad you made this a priority here uh, tonight. What a wonderful time it was yesterday as God used Dr. Jim both in the Sunday school hour and then in the evening service, and I thank the Lord for the work that he is doing 
in our hearts, and we're certainly looking forward to what he's going to do tonight, then tomorrow night, and on Wednesday, tomorrow again at 7, and then Wednesday night at 7.30. You are invited tomorrow morning in the Music Hall at 10 o'clock if you'd like to come and hear Dr. Jim as he continues this for the college uh, during the day, uh, one session each day, Tuesday and Wednesday. Let me mention this before I mention a couple of things, and that is that uh, uh, tonight through Wednesday night, we'll be taking a love offering for Dr. Jim, one of the good opportunities we have to give uh, that to encourage his ministry and himself personally. Um, Dr. Jim, we could give love offerings quite a bit for him because of all the behind the scenes work that he does. You think of all the times he speaks, all the times that he's involved in our ministry here, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. And so uh, this is the one opportunity as we have an actual meeting that we can uh, do uh, as a church, uh, uh, really to show the Lord how much we love him by uh, giving to this servant. So I do want to encourage you to give everything tonight will go directly, unless otherwise designated, as a love offering to uh, Dr. Jim. Uh, we do want to encourage you as we move forward here to remember uh, how important it is to be here at 6.30 on Wednesdays for our, our very important leadership time as we prepare, prepare Sunday school, especially here at the beginning of the year. This is going to be vitally important, and that's why we have the Wednesday night service at 7.30. So I do want to encourage you right now to plan ahead for that. And then remember, a week from Saturday, our all-day uh, Plan, uh, planning time, which in light of what I presented on Sunday, I think you can see how important it is that we gather together, and there'll be a lot more that we'll be telling you and instructing you at that time. So I really would encourage it and be, urge you to make that a priority for a week from Saturday. Well, we had a good time at the Labor Day picnic. That was a crowd there today. That was great. Uh, the sun wasn't beating down us, so we don't have the shining back that we normally do on Labor Day night. So, uh, and I trust all of you are still whole and not too uh, uh, messed up from the day as you uh, played volleyball, softball. It was, it, we had probably, do we have anybody play horseshoes? We didn't have that. I was going to say, that's probably where the injuries occurred. <laughs> but uh, nobody uh, played that, so... That was a great time and appreciate all those that uh, put work in that today. All right, ushers come. Let's take our offering here tonight. Let's stand for a word of prayer. And uh, this love offering, let's ask God's blessing. Now, Lord, would you work in tonight's service? Lord, we have that deep sense of need for you to continue to plow deeper in our hearts and to show us all that we have in you. Thank you. We have new life in Christ. Now, I do pray that you will bless this offering. Lord, we uh, want to be the full blessing that we ought to be to this ministry that has uh, had such a vital role in this church. For you'll be with Dr. Jim and Lord with this offering. I would truly glorify you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
have you to give in these next couple days here for the offering. Let me encourage you to uh, recognize, or to, I want to let you know, excuse me, that we will have giving on, online available, already is there. So if you would want to pray about that. And uh, typically, whenever I pray about an offering, I give more than I thought I was going to do at first. So uh, pray about it. Uh, you'll actually come out ahead because the Lord will bless you for it and also be a blessing to anybody that uh, we, the Lord puts on our heart to give to. So I uh, trust that you'll be praying about that. 227 in your hymnal, please. 227, The Cleansing Wave. So we think about this song and the glory of our walk with the Lord. Oh, now I see the cleansing wave, the fountain deep and wide. Let's go ahead and stand one more time before the preaching tonight. 227. Mighty 
Amen. That was good. I sing the mighty power of God. And every time we look up into the sky, it's certainly a reminder that we have a great God. I don't know about you. Sometimes I've been down a little bit discouraged. And I look up there and thinking, man, what am I discouraged about? The God that I serve made all that. And it really is remarkable. Thank, uh, thankful for that reminder. And I hope it'll encourage us tonight. John chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, John chapter number 7. And I know on the uh, Labor Day picnic night, it is a, a little bit more of a challenge to preach. You know why? Because you're wiped out. Okay, so uh, sometimes when I'm preaching to teenagers, I've never done it, but I have been tempted to do something to wake them up that would be extremely novel. Now, I, uh, I've always wanted to do this, get a super soaker that was like big time, had big time water pressure, get that thing all jacked up underneath the pulpit. First guy starts fading it down, just hit him between the eyes. But um, uh, when you work with teenagers, you think weird things. But um, I've never done it, but I thought it would be a lot of fun. I remember as a youth pastor, one time I found a starter gun in the youth pastor's desk. I was only there for a few short months as an interim youth pastor for my dad. I found a starter gun, and the thing was flat out loud. Uh, you hit that thing, it sounded like a real gun. And uh, I had a, a real hard time, a real hard time, uh, when I went to youth group on Wednesday night getting their attention. They were, they were good kids, but they would just, you know, they're attacking, talking, whatever. And, and one day I brought that little starter gun in there. I'll say, I'll see if this will get their attention. And I said, okay, it's time for Wednesday night, nothing. Time for Wednesday night, nothing. Time for Wednesday night, reached up, went poof. I saw kids levitate. I mean, literally came out of their seats. It was a lot of fun. Okay, but anyway... So I should bring the starter gun here tonight just in case pop thing thing off. Some of you that would fall asleep would be levitating. The only trouble is if some of you are packing heat, I might be in trouble. Okay, so certainly wouldn't do that down south, but um, could do it in New York or California, but not down south. Okay, uh, if that's a little political humor. If you didn't get it, um, there's some other political humor you may not get tonight as well. Okay, John chapter number seven tonight. And... Um, we, of course, started on the very uh, first uh, Sunday morning just yesterday talking about the co-infections of moral impurity, dealt with several of them. And last night we dealt with a big one, the real big one, selfishness. We all know that the Bible teaches us that every sin you and I have comes from that issue. We're drawn away of our own lusts, our own desires, our own self, uh, and we're enticed, we're tempted. And so we recognize that. It was a help to me. It's a help to everyone. No matter what sin issue we have, we have to go bottom line, that's my core problem. And I want to deal now, kind of go a different direction tonight, and want to deal with the fact that when it comes to overcoming any sin issue in our life, there is something that is particularly essential. And particularly in the arena of moral impurity, this issue, uh, this particular truth is absolutely essential. In fact, there will be absolutely no sustained victory without this particular truth. And that is going to be, as a moment, we'll just simply see a vibrant, real spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not going through the motions. It's meeting with God all the time. There is no sustained victory without it. It's impossible. If you not meet with God, it's like one man described it. He said, I got sin out of my life. He said it was, I think, months, maybe in a couple of years uh, in the moral arena. But he said it was just like pressure. I just felt like I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. And he said, finally, when someone helped him understand that the only way you could ever have sustained victory was that there would not be a vacuum. There had to be a relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, when I got a hold of that, God brought me into a victory I never thought possible. There's something about our walk with God. So we're going to look at John chapter number 7 here tonight. And it's important to understand here what, what, what uh, Jesus is attempting to do is, is not put a Band-Aid on the problem and he's fixed it. You, you've heard this. Jesus said, I am come that you, uh, says, I, I, I want to make you, follow me and I will make you, anybody tell me? Any, I will make you, versus amen. Is it better to give a, a poor man fish or is it better to teach him how to fish? Well, it's better to teach him how to fish because now he has, uh, he has a mechanism to be able to get what he needs and he doesn't have to keep looking for somebody to give him fish and that certainly is important in life it kind of reminds me i i don't know why but i was uh, uh looking at some uh, press press conference from the president today and a commercial came up i won't say which party but you'll be able to figure it out a commercial came up and it was a lady on there talking about she lost her job and uh, she was all upset because the president earmarked billions of dollars for businesses and uh, she got very little 
And I thought to myself, she has no clue, no clue. So what would you rather do? Give the, out of work, uh, give the workers money or give the businesses who make jobs money? See, if you give the businesses job, uh, money, they, make, they, they keep going and they sustain the jobs so you don't lose the jobs. Okay, my point is simply this. God always goes to a solution that is lasting. He goes to a solution that is lasting. He's not going to just give you fish. He's going to teach you how to fish. And it's very important for every Christian in this room to understand that God is out for permanent solution. And he's going to tell us in John chapter 7 a permanent solution to a real problem that we human beings have. And you know what it's called? Fulfillment. <laughs> fulfillment. You know, if you go out and just talk to people on the streets, you'll find that most people are not fulfilled. Because money will not fulfill you in and of itself. Uh, prestige will not fulfill you. Uh, uh, fame will not fulfill you in and of itself. Really nothing the world has to offer us will fulfill us uh, at all, ever will. But God has in this passage of Scripture something that can fulfill us for the entire life and not only fulfill us, but touch others. And in doing so, of course, that's part of the fulfillment. So right here in John chapter number 7, let's begin. Because the Lord Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the last day of the feast. And as I understand it, there was in that particular time, there was the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam, they'd get some water, they'd come up, there was some kind of ceremony where they would pour out the water, and in doing so they would commemorate God's provision of water in the wilderness, which was of course miraculous. And of course uh, the children of Israel had missed the whole point. It was the idea of provision of literal or physical water, and so they just kept it on the physical plane, and Jesus came and comes along and says, you missed the whole point. That was a picture of something much more significant that was much more fulfilling, and that is spiritual water. And he gives us a real significance of that picture in the wilderness in verse number 37. So, in the last day, that great the feast of tabernacles, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now, the, the key to this passage of Scripture is that little phrase that says, if any man thirst. When it comes to fulfillment in the Christian life, there first and always must be a thirst for it. If you study the Bible, you will simply understand that throughout the Word of God, from all the way at the beginning to the end, is a metaphor. Sometimes it's seek and you'll find. Sometimes it's thirst and you'll be fulfilled. Uh, there's different metaphors, but the picture is the same, and that's the idea there has to be a pursuit. There has to be a thirst. Now, sometimes people say, well, what does that look like? What do you, how do you thirst for God? Now, it's important for us to understand thirst is a wonderful picture because, number one, thirst is not meritorious. Do you know when you're thirsty, you don't earn anything? You remember when you were a kid, you might even come into your house sometime and say to your mom, 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 I'm dying of thirst. Well, the truth is you weren't dying of thirst. You were thirsty, but that thirst didn't earn you anything. All thirst does, it, it, it dominates you so that you kind of put other things aside and you put your focus on, i got to get some water, i got to get some Gatorade or whatever it might be. But it certainly doesn't earn anything. You can be thirsty and go into McDonald's and order their dollar Coke. But when they say it's going to be a buck five or a buck six or whatever, depending on what state you're in, uh, like I said, California would be a buck fifty. But anyway, uh, but uh, if you, uh, when they ask for the money, you say, what do you mean ask for, man, I'm, man, can't you see, man, I am absolutely famished. I am dying of thirst. Do you know that thirst is not going to earn you that Coke from McDonald's? Did you know that? So understand that thirst does not earn the water from God. It's just that you won't want the water without it. Now, one of the problems in our culture today is simply this. There are what I call thirst dullers. They're certainly not thirst quenchers. They're thirst dullers. And the amazing thing about thirst is in the physical realm, if you are becoming dehydrated, you cannot escape it. It consumes you. And the more dehydrated you are, the more focused you come on, I've got to get water. But in the spiritual realm, that's not necessarily true. You can literally be dying of spiritual thirst and have that thirst dulled. Now I'm convinced today one of the great dangers of technology is this. It dulls our thirst. Media dulls our thirst. Some aspects of entertainment dull our thirst. And think about it, friends. How many people in our culture do not like silence? 
Sometimes we fall into that too. You ever just hopped in your car or your truck and, and you turn on the radio, just almost automatically. I, I for years did that. I've kind of gotten out of that because I, there's some other things that uh, I've realized I need to do in that truck uh, that won't involve the radio. But we turn on the radio. Well, I don't know what it is. We, and we get distracted. It's not that it's wrong necessarily what we're hearing in the news, but if we're not careful, we can get distracted and we can get dulled and we forget the fact that we're literally dying of spiritual thirst. It says, if any man thirsts, Jesus just said, you're not going to get this truth until you come to a point where you need it. Several years ago, we did the um, a Revival Road Conference. Some of you may remember it. It's quite a few years back. And uh, in it, we uh, really recommend that all of the uh, speakers read the book, They Found the Secret by V. Raymond Hedman. They Found the Secret is a wonderful book. I assume it's in the bookstore, but uh, if it's not, they could get it for you. And it's little biographies of men and women that have greatly been used of God. And then really the thing that's worth the book, the two or three pages at the end, V. Raymond Edmund puts the commonalities in the story. There were people from all kinds of theological traditions. It's kind of interesting. Some of them we would not be as much affinity with on some of their theology except they're all gospel oriented. But it's very interesting. In the end he takes the commonalities in the story and he puts down the very first step in every single one of the stories. And if you read them it's true is thirst. There came a time when they became dissatisfied with the status Whoa. And some of them began to fast and pray. Some of them began to spend the time to seek God. Some of them said, God, I cannot go on this way. I'd rather die than go on this way. God, you got to do something. Thirst. If any man thirst. You say, well, preacher, what does that look like? I'm in the Bible. What does that look like? Okay, let me just tell you. It's the book of Psalms. Much of the Psalms is literally teaching us how the Bible views the issue of thirsting. Uh, as the heart panted after the water brook, so my soul panted after thee, O God. My soul thirsted for God, for the living God. Sound like the psalmist wants God? O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My flesh longeth for thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and glory, so as I've seen thee in the sanctuary. A few verses later, my soul followeth hard after God. Psalm 84, my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. I'm just telling you this, you will never experience what John 7, 37 through 39 is talking about without thirst. He says, if any man thirsts. Sometimes you just got to turn off the old cell phone and say, God, I'm sick and tired of being distracted. I'm sick and tired of being dulled. God, I need you. Now, many of us know for the last few years we've had an emphasis on spending an hour with God. Let me just simply say, if you spend an hour with God and it becomes mechanical, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is spending an hour with God because you've got to find Him. You know what really the hour of God is? Seeking God every single day. God, I need you today. I can't go on without you. God, I, 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 I need your, your wisdom. I need your strength. God, I can't do this without you. And the truth is, friend, if you think you can live the Christian life without God, you don't understand the Christian life. Like we talked about it out at the picnic today. The Christian life is 100% absolutely miraculous. It needs supernatural intervention. You cannot do the Christian life without God. And if you do the Christian life without, with God, I'm going to tell you this, what's going to happen is going to be impossible. It's supernatural. Listen, every time you meet with God, that's a miracle. Every time God enables you to give the gospel with power, that's a miracle. Every time you have wisdom in a situation to do what God wants you to do, it's a miracle. I am telling you, friends, every single day of our Christian lives ought to be one miracle after another, after another, after another, because the Christian life is impossible without God. But the truth is, we learn how to do it without God. We know how to go through the motions. We know how to say the right things, do the right things. Sometimes just check off the boxes. But the Bible says, if any man thirsts, if you're out here saying, man, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of my powerlessness. I'm sick of my sin. I'm sick of going back to that sin over and over again. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of not meeting with God. I'm sick of not having any meaning in life. I'm sick of it. You're way closer to the truth than the person who's away from God and doesn't understand it, doesn't know it. It says, if any man thirsts. I'm just telling you, friends, I don't care. All you preacher boys in here, I'm going to tell you right now. When you get that, that uh, diploma on your wall, that's not near as important as you knowing God. Now, it's important in the sense you've got to, get that, you've got to meet that goal. But here's my point. You can have that diploma, but if you don't know the presence of God in your life, then you're not ready. It says, if any man thirsts. If any man thirsts. 
Now, notice what it says. So you say, well, preacher, I am thirsty. I, I'm sick of being defeated. I, and I'm sick of not walking with God. And I'm sick of that sin getting me way too often. And I'm, I'm sick of even having to defeat my brain. Maybe I haven't looked at things for a while now, but I'm sick of continually being defeated in my mind. I'm sick of it. Okay, you're ready now. Jesus says, if any man thirsts. So you say, what am I supposed to do? I'm thirsty. Okay, here's what he says to do. Let him come unto me and drink. So how are you going to do that? Well, if Jesus lived in Jerusalem, you'd get a plane ticket, couldn't you? You could fly into Jerusalem, you could stand in line, and you could come to Jesus and drink. But we all know it can't be literal because Jesus is at the right hand of God in heaven. So how does He mean coming to me and drink? What's He talking about? <laughs> well, the greatest commentary on the Bible, this may shock you, is the Bible. Notice what the next phrase says. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Wow. So you say, well, you, preacher, is you saying it's yet believe? That's exactly it. But there's, I see two nuances of this. It's depending on the Holy Spirit to lead you, and it's depending on the Holy Spirit to enable you. So what you might call the two oars. Some of you heard my brother John talk about or in some of his books, the, the two oars in a, on a boat, a little bo rowboat. Uh, you know what happens if you get in a rowboat and only row on, with one oar on one side of the boat? What happens? You go in circles. See, you've done it. I can tell. Okay, most of us have. Okay, and then uh, what happens if you row on the other side with the oar? Well, you go in circles in a different way, but you go in circles on the other side. Now think about this for a moment. If you're coming to the Lord and saying, okay, Lord, Show me what to do. I don't know what to do with my life, but God, show me what to do, and I'll try as hard as I can to do it. You know what you will happen? You will go in circles. You're depending on the Lord for leadership, but you're not depending on the Lord for enablement. You'll spin. Or you could go to the other side and say, God, I got great plans. I got really good plans. God, such great plans that here's what I need you to do. I need you to strengthen me to do what I want to do. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is that going to work? No, you're going to go on the other side. Okay, so both are needed. God, show me what to do, number one. And number two, God, enable me to do it. That's when you got both oars in the water, and that's when you're heading forward. So here it is. Jesus says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture have said, here's the promise, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, I just want to let you in on something. If I can let you in on this, maybe it'll be a help to you. I just want to let you in on something. This has to be figurative. You know how I know that? You ever seen anybody walking around with water gushing out of their stomach? <laughs> Boy, you'd be, you, wow, wow, that's, that's a little different. <laughs> yeah, it would be real different. So it couldn't be literal. We know it's not. Obviously, it's a spirit. So really, the verse is talking about a spiritual dynamic. I, I only say that because it, it needs to be said. It's talking about something that is spiritual, but yet is no less real. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I want every one of us to get a hold of this simple truth, and it's this simple. You are either a fountain of life or you are a fountain of death. There is no in-between. I'm going to just turn, you, I'm going to turn two nouns into verbs. I know this is good English, but this is for speaking effect, okay? Uh, here it is. You either life people or you death people. Now, all of us in this room have life people if you've walked with God any time in your life, and all of us in this room have death people. I know that. Now, have you ever noticed that death has a peculiar smell? Have you ever noticed that? Well, I, um, I remember a few years ago, I went down to the basement of our house and thinking, whoa, what crawled down here and died? It was clearly something that died down there. Couldn't find it. And what I didn't, didn't know is um, that uh, we had this Humididex that uh, uh, Robbie Milburn had put in from Canada, something used up there. And, and uh, we didn't realize it, but we had evidently turned it on. A chipmunk had come to the louvers, dropped to the bottom, and we had turned on the, the, the fan, and we had a chopped chip, I guess, whatever you want to call it, but it chopped him up. And uh, we didn't know that. We had no idea we had just murdered a chipmunk over there. I surely hope it wasn't Chipper Dale. But anyway, uh, but one of them down there, we just murdered the guy, and uh, we didn't know it. So you know what happened? That's worse than a mouse. Most of you have had a mouse die in your house, but a chipmunk... 
I'm telling you, it stunk down there. It was not, a, we couldn't find it. We could not find it until his cousin dropped in the humidex one day and we heard him down there. And so we opened up the humidex and uh, he jumped out of the hum humidex. We chased him around the basement. I'm telling you, it was one of the funnest things our family has ever done. We chased him around the basement, chased him up the stairs and out into the yard. That was great. Should have got on on video, uh, but we didn't do that. We went, that would probably back before the day. But um, then, when we were putting the thing back, we saw his poor cousin, what was left of him. And then we, oh, yeah, that's where that came from. See, death has a stench to it, doesn't it? And may I say this? When you're short with your wife or short with your husband, and we've all had moments where we weren't walking in the Spirit and said something that wasn't kind, something that was short, guess what we just did? We death them. You're unkind to your roommate, sarcastic your roommate, put them down a little bit, trying to lift yourself up. Guess what happens, college student? You just death the roommate. We all understand this dynamic. The workplace, get frustrated with a co-worker, and you death your co-worker. So the Bible is helping us understand when we're walking in the flesh, all we got to offer is death. You give me a bunch of teenagers, and you know what they, and that are not right with God, guess what they do? They death each other. Talk about things they have no business talking about. Talk about movies they're watching no Christian should watch. They death each other with their language, with their attitudes, with everything. They death each other. Remember college student, when you're together with other college students, you're either, you're either life in them or you're death in them. You are never neutral. So this passage of Scripture is helping us understand when it comes to this phenomenon of life. Now the amazing thing about this fountain is we are a channel of a, of a water or a life that is not our own. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is water that immediately brings life to people. Anybody in this room who has walked with God in any kind of consistency in your life can know there's simple times you realize that God used you to touch a life and you look back and say, how'd that happen? I'll tell you how it happened. Because you were a channel of His life. Literally out of your belly was flowing spiritual water that was fulfilling people, meeting people's needs, touching people. Listen, I am telling you, in this church, I have talked to people who lifed me. I don't care who you are, myself included. There are times I come to church, and you know what? I need God to life me. What about you? Sometimes we call that revive, but you understand? There's some of you probably didn't even know it, just your word, just exactly what, boom, exactly what I needed. And all of a sudden, you sensed the presence of God in your life. You were life. You touched Jesus. You touched the channel. See, it, it really was a marvelous plan. Think of it, friends. It was a marvelous plan. I, I know I've said this before, but really think of it. It was a marvelous plan. Could Jesus have stayed on planet Earth? Well, He could have. But none of us would have really have interacted with Him. I mean, maybe once in our life we'd have gotten over to the Bible lands and stepped in line on the deal. But, it, it, but, you know, friends, it was a marvelous plan. You know what Jesus did? He said, if I go back to heaven, I'll tell you what. I'll send out my spirit to every believer, and every believer on planet Earth will become a potential channel for my presence. Wow. In this room right now, I guarantee you, there are people who are right now channels of Jesus Christ. And if God leads you across your path tonight, you're going to get lifed. But it won't be them. It will be the life of Jesus flowing through them. Wow. See, that's what the passage is talking about. That's why you can see people who are literally in total addiction to the flesh, who get right with God and begin to take Bible steps. And, and like I said, there's, there's obviously sometimes major steps that come, and then they get in sustained victory and become a channel of blessing to reach others who are as addicted as they once were. And they find such fulfillment and pulling people out of the same sin that enslaved them. You think they just want to jump up and down all the time. They're so excited about it. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened. They tapped into the life of Jesus. They would tell you they got to meet with Jesus every day. They can't help anybody addicted without Jesus. Rivers of living water. Now, here's the key. You say, well, preacher, I have thirsted for God, and, and I do believe I'm depending on Him for leadership, and I believe I'm depending on for an enablement, but it doesn't seem to work for me. Okay, hang on. Here's, here's a very important point. Expectation. Do you know, it, 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 what would you do if you were witnessing to your next door neighbor, oh yeah, I want to get saved. I want Jesus to wash my sins away and save me. Okay, okay, okay. You know what to do? Yeah, they pray, and they, you, they look up and say, you said, if you died right now, where would you go? Oh, I'd go to hell. I said, what did you just pray? Well, I prayed and asked Jesus to save me, but I don't think he did. 
Would you be excited about that salvation decision? And the answer is, well, no, because that's not called faith. That's called unbelief. You tracking with me? How many times in our Christian life do we do this? God, I need you. God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. God, show me. I'll do it. God, I'm yielded to your leadership. God, I need your strength. I can't do whatever you ask me to do. I know I won't be able to do it, but I'm trusting you to do it. And here's the key. And I'm expecting you to do it because you said you would. Notice what it says there. It's a promise. If you believe on me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You'll become a channel of His life. Now, one of the keys with faith, and I think it's very important to understand this, we talked a little bit about this in Sunday school, faith is one of those things that Satan is doing everything he can to get out of your life. And one of the things we talked about in Sunday school is when you push your conscience away, you shipwreck your faith. So when you allow sin to come in your life and you're not willing to deal with it and the Holy Spirit and your conscience is going after the deal and you're pushing it off, guess what you're doing? You're shipwrecking your faith so you can't even trust Him. That's why harboring sin and not dealing with it biblically is so devastating because in order to do it, you must push away your conscience and the Holy Spirit and you will shipwreck your faith. I don't care who you are. If you're a freshman sitting out here, sophomore sitting out here, and you're thinking, man, I got some junk I need to unload to mom and dad, and you keep pushing your conscience off, I want you to understand that's no small matter. You are shipwrecking your faith. That's what it says. So faith is one of those fragile things we need to understand that it can be destroyed. It can be shipwrecked when you push God off here, push God off here, push God off here. Because the Bible's telling the whole key to the effective Christian life is you're going to believe. Well, another thing very important about believing is faith must be nurtured. Must be nurtured. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's why every morning and every day we need to open our Bible and say, God, I need, I need my faith. I don't know about you. I also wake up in the morning sometimes and I don't know. Have you ever woke up in the morning and felt like the inside of a tennis shoe? Are you with me on the deal? Have you ever woke, woke up in the morning and felt like a spiritual bum? You ever done that? <laughs> you ever woke up in the morning and said, man, where's God? Man, I just, you know what I found? The key to overcoming that is to go to bed right. But if you don't go to bed right, you usually won't wake up right. I have found that to be very true. But you wake up thinking, man, I need God. And I many times have to open the Bible and say, God, I need a fresh touch. I need something fresh from heaven. And I will tell you, I'm sure you've had it happen. I've had it happen. You're reading the Word of God, and all of a sudden, man, it just comes alive. And it speaks life to your soul. You know what God's doing? He's refueling the tank. That's why Scripture memory, meditation is so important because the Bible is the fuel. It fuels the faith. Listen, you can have great faith, but if it's in Buddha, it won't do you any good. Your faith has to be in the right object. People have sometimes have great faith. Some of them have great faith, faith in one of the political parties. Well, that's a mistake. In fact, it might have, be bad to have great faith in either party. But nonetheless, you know, we have great faith in all kinds of stuff. But the point, the real thing, the only thing that will never let you down is God and His Word. So that faith has to be nurtured, it has to be fueled, and it certainly cannot be quenched. And we allow sin to come between us and God, and we won't deal with it. We're pushing away our conscience, we're shipwrecking our faith. Once you deal with that, now you're in a place where you can fuel that faith and wake up every morning and say, God, I need a fresh touch. God, I need you today. But the key, I, friends, is real simple. It's believing God, trusting Him, and that it is expecting Him to show up. Now, let me just simply say that what we are talking about here, I've already kind of mentioned this, but I want to kind of bring it through again. What we are talking about is a spiritual reality. In other words, the presence of God, the reality of the Holy Spirit in our life is not something that is assimilated by the five senses. Could I say this? The spiritual is not grabbed a hold of by the sensory. The sensory, thank the Lord for our five senses, we use those to assimilate physical data all the time. And we're seeing things, hearing things, and we're assimilating that data into our brain and making all kinds of conclusions. And, and that's why many times it's so neat, a little baby, you can kind of start seeing them and they're trying to take all this data, like where did this come from, you know? And they're starting to put all that data into their heads. And a little baby is just like a blank slate. It's a, certainly a wonderful opportunity, but also a grave responsibility. You think, you got a blank slate here, and those five senses are coming alive. But in our world, you know what we do? We're absolutely crazy about the five senses, and we ignore the greatest one, and that's the spiritual. 
See, the spiritual dynamic is not assimilated. It's, it's not. It's like this. Can I say this, friends? Uh, the Bible puts it this way. When you got saved, your spirit got regenerated. It was dead. And God moved in and he made it alive. And that human spirit that you have now becomes uh, the, the boat of the divine spirit. And there's a union I don't totally understand. But uh, at that reality, that is where you meet God. You meet God in the realm of the spiritual. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Where you will connect with God is in the spiritual. Let me just say, young people, and even moms and dads, if you don't hardly know what I'm talking about, you can, but it will never come until you get on pursuit. God, I've got to have you. I can't go on without you. And it comes one where you begin to cause, seek God and expect Him to do a work in your heart. I've said this before, but I remember when I was in college, I don't even know who gave it to me. It wasn't new, but somebody handed me the classic book, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And I remember reading that entire book my freshman year. And all I can tell you is this, something burned in my heart. And I remember thinking to myself, I hardly understand what this man's talking about, but whatever he's talking about, I need it. And I would say in a very serious way, my freshman year began the pursuit of God. It's, one of the, it's the greatest pursuit you will ever go on in your entire life, the pursuit of God. I certainly haven't done it perfectly. I understand that. But it is a pursuit that uh, is my intention to do it to the day I die, the pursuit of God. And what this passage of Scripture is telling us, when you get on that pursuit, God will become a spiritual reality to you. And that spiritual reality, it's like a kid. I remember one time he came to me, started talking to me about the hour of God. I can't even remember. I think I'd mentioned it in preaching. And, and he said, I'm going to try that. And I thought, well, you can try it. I didn't give him a book. I didn't give him any help. I probably should have, but I can't remember. It was just come and go. And, and he said, I'm going to spend an hour with God. Two or three days later, he came back to me beaming. He said, Brother Van Gelderen, he said, I spent an hour with God. He said, I don't know how to explain it. God was there. I thought, well, hallelujah. You don't have to have, I'm all for the book. Don't get me wrong. But you can actually meet with God if you'll pursue him. Point is simply this, friends. That uh, when you pursue God, the Bible says He will be found. So here's the point. God, I'm looking at you for leadership. God, I'm looking at you for enablement. I need you to show up in my life. And I'm expecting you to do it. Now, nobody in this room who's ever experienced the presence of God would say, I, I don't know about you, but anytime that there's the reality of God's presence in my life, that is what I would call the epitome of, of living the Christian life. Man, you know God's there. Wow, this is great. You're enjoying the presence of God. You know He's there. There's a confidence in your life. It's like you can pray about everything. No, God's going to answer. We've all, I hope, all been there. If you haven't been, you can be. God's no respecter of persons. But have ever you ever noticed that sometimes it seems like God left? Where'd God go? He was here just a moment ago. What happened? Sometimes, friends, if we're not careful, there's a several reasons why. And I want to just conclude with an illustration I think I've given here before. I think it was a couple years ago, but I'm not exactly sure. But I'm going to repeat it because I know some of you were not here. That helps me understand the pursuit of God. It has really helped me to be on a much more consistent instead of a roller coaster up and down. I want to use an analogy about something I have really no experience firsthand. But I did have an uncle, and he's now with the Lord, Uncle Jim Stoutenborough, who uh, was an, flew an airplane. My uncle was um, kind of unique because at 16 years old, he was orphaned. His dad uh, died when he was, I think, 16. And he did something he probably wouldn't have done as his dad lived. You say, what did he do? He built an airplane. Not a model airplane, an airplane. <laughs> and he uh, had got a kit, built it, and it was one you fly. And he got a license, and there was a 16-year-old kid in the skies over Moroa, Illinois. <laughs> now, you think a 16-year-old driver on ground is a problem, put him in an airplane, you really got a problem. And my uncle, with no parents to rein him in on the deal, and was, without his prefrontal cortex being fully developed, all you conquer serious people, uh, he had nothing to, you know, keep him kind of safe. I remember my uncle saying, he said, Jim, it's a miracle I lived out of my teen years. And after hearing his stories, I would say, that's true. <laughs> he would dive bomb farmers. That was his favorite. 
you know, fireman would be out plowing his field like this, you know, and he'd just go into a dive bomb right down to the farmer. He'd look up, jump off the tractor, he'd pull out like that. See, I'm sure you now understand. He would also fly under bridges. I'm talking about a bridge, here's a bridge, here's the water, just like that. Did all kinds of crazy stuff. My uncle loved to fly what you might call by the seat of your pants. Flying by the seat of pants is just hopping on the plane and flying. You're not looking at the instruments. You're just using the horizon. You're using uh, landscape. You're just using the world. And he loved that. But into his 20s, uh, one day there was a revival meeting. Dr. Bill Rice was scheduled to come and preach. And my uncle by that time had kind of been known as a guy who could lead the singing. Well, the truth is <laughs> he couldn't sing, but he could lead singing. He could not carry a tune in a bucket. If you know anything about Jim Stoutenbarrel, there's one thing you'll remember. You never heard him sing. That's why, because he couldn't. Okay, but uh, he could lead singing. He was God's joke on song leading. Absolutely, one of the best song leaders I've ever. Listen, if you think you got no talents when it comes to certain things, well, Jim Stoutenborough, especially on music, that's where he'd be. You know the funny thing about it? Jim Stoutenborough led singing at Falls Baptist Church. And he couldn't carry a dude in a bucket. How many remember Jim Stoutenborough? Unbelievable, you can't forget him. Okay, but one day he was leading singing in his 20s. And Dr. Bill Rice was an hour late. Can you imagine going to song service an hour late? Dr. Bill Rice came in, preached, and when he was done, his first thing was, who's the song leader? Who's the song leader? i got to find that song leader. That crowd was as fresh as like a man I had been on time. i got to find that song leader. Well, they introduced him to Jim Stoutenborough and began a lifelong friendship. Eventually, and my uncle ended up going to the Bill Rice Ranch, but for a while there in central Illinois, he was known as the Flying Farmer. I've seen handbills where it would have the evangelist name, many of them I don't know of. Their history didn't remember their names, but they were good men, had God's hand on their life. There would be an evangelist name, and then down at the bottom it said, Song Lady, Jim Stoutenborough, then have it under a nickname, The Flying Farmer. And part of the, time, the reason that was is because sometimes he'd farm during the day, get in his airplane, and fly to a revival meeting. My uncle said more than once the auditorium was so packed they had to open a side window and pull him in to lead song leading because they couldn't get him in the building because he would be coming in late because not late but you know right before the service because he had farmed all day and flew in there and then in the morning morning light he'd fly back sometimes and and things like that and he'd farm so he, he would be using his airplane quite a bit. Well, I don't know when. I think when I was a little boy, I, I couldn't calculate out exactly when it was. He made the decision: I need to get my instrument ready. And my uncle did not want to fly by an instrument rating. You know what an instrument rating is? It's when you, um, you know, you're in clouds or it's dark and, and you, you've, got to, you've got to fly by your instruments. You can't fly by the horizon because there isn't one, okay? Yeah, you've, got to, you've got to fly by that instrument panel. Now, my uncle hated it. You know why? It was like flying in a simulator. But it's very important if you're fogged in or in darkness, it's very important to know how to fly by the instruments because if you don't, you die. It's a huge motivation. Okay, so anyway, he learned how to fly by the instrument panel. But he didn't like it. In fact, when he would fly by the instrument panel, particularly if it was fogging, you know what his heartbeat would be? Man, I hope this fog lifts. Because he loved to fly by the seat of his pants. He just loved to. I mean, till, the, till his older years when he finally had to give it up, I mean, he just loved that. I mean, he's the kind of guy that go up in his airplane and he tilt his wings and wave goodbye to you with his wings of his airplane. I mean, my uncle just loved flying. Now, you get the analogy? All of us in this room love the moments in our Christian life when the fog's lifted and we're enjoying the presence of God. I mean, we're just having a ball up there doing barrel rolls. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, just having a ball up there and just enjoying God, enjoying His presence. And then all of a sudden, fog rolls in. How many would be honest? I'm going to ask you to be honest tonight. How many would say, you know, preacher, that's happened to me. I've been walking with God. All of a sudden, fog rolls in. That's happened to me. Okay. And uh, you say, where does that come from? Well, I could preach a whole message on fog. Let me just give you a few ideas. Sometimes it is a satanic attack. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes I believe it comes from God. You say, why would it come from God? Because sometimes, don't miss this, we begin to trust our experience more than the instrument panel. You know why God puts the fog in? So you go back to the instrument panel. Instead of trusting your experience, you go back to trust the instrument panel. Another reason I believe that God sometimes allows fog to roll in is because, don't miss this, we take His presence for granted. Maybe get a little edgy, we enjoying His presence, but we stop really looking to Him to lead us, and we get a little, you know, a little compromise here. Maybe it's not much, but you know, we kind of take His presence for granted. 
Do you remember when you were a little kid and took your mother's presents for granted? I remember when I was four years old taking my mother's presents for granted one time. Now, when you're four years old, there is only one thing in all of the universe that brings you security, and that is mama. <laughs> Mama's around, we're okay. Dad's not too bad, but mama's big. And that, you know, when you're, when you're four years old, that's huge. And so I remember I was at an airport, the Durango, Colorado airport, huge airport, you know, one gate. But anyway, huge airport. And uh, I'm, uh, there's the glass, you know, and these airplanes out there, 16 seaters. We're talking huge airplanes. And I am, I'm a four year old kid. I've never seen stuff like this before. I am. It's like my kids. I remember when they first saw air. I remember when Jana was two years old and we were flying an airplane and she's just looking out the window, pointing, saying, Daddy, look at the airplane. Look at it. She was so excited about it. She'd never seen airplanes like that. Well, that's the way it was, except the airplanes were smaller, but I'd never seen them like that before. So I'm up against the glass. You know how it is, you know, up against the glass. The kind of person the janitor hates. But anyway, up against the glass, you know, I'm out there looking at those airplanes, all completely enamored with them. When all of a sudden in my four year old brain, it hit me Where's mama? Because I lost all sense of security. I could care less about the airplanes at that moment. You know what? I, I got to find mother. Crowded gate. I remember that was crowded. Remember when they, this is going to really date me. Do you remember that when anybody could go through security? And well, remember when there was no security. But anyway, remember when you could go to the gate? Anybody could go to the gate. Uh, and so the place was packed. I mean, there's people everywhere. And in panic, I looked around those gates and I didn't see anybody that I recognized. Nobody. I was in total panic. But you know, when you're four years old, you largely, I don't know if you remember this, you know, some people remember when they're little, but some people don't. But I kind of remember that. I mean, this vividly. I, I, you identified people differently than by their face. You know, when you're, when you're just down here, you, you, you can't, you know, your identification level is like knees, shoes, you know, I'm talking pants, skirts. And, and uh, so I identified a pair of legs I was sure was my mother's. Absolutely certain. There was no doubt. And in my total panic, I began a full run toward those legs. I mean, it was chariots of fire. I mean, I'm telling you, I was absolutely, I was in the thing. You know, I was running right toward those things. Man, I hit those legs. I wrapped my arms around them, looked up, but it wasn't my mother. Okay. It has, it has damaged me to this very moment. The funny thing was, I was an absolute horror. And I think the lady was pretty shocked, too. And uh, I almost took her down. You know what I'm talking about? It, it was almost like a tackle football. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I, my mother, across the way, saw the whole thing happen. And she came up and got me. And I don't know why she did this, but she kept laughing for about a half hour. I mean, she just caught, thought it was the funniest thing. I didn't think it was funny. But here's the point I want you to understand. I took her presence for granted, didn't I? Sometimes we take God's presence for granted, don't we? Here's the whole point I want you to understand that I believe John 7 is helping us with. Whenever the fog rolls in, there may be a variety of reasons why, but the answer is all the same. You get back to the instant panel. You know why? Because the instrument panel nurtures your faith. It's the instrument panel. It's depending on, okay, God, there's your promises. Uh, I'm trusting you to lead me. I'm trusting you to enable me. Years ago, I had a young preacher. In fact, he's not young any longer, and he gave the illustration here just a few years ago. And it was funny because we have talked about it. He gave the same illustration, and I give the same illustration. We've never talked about it. But I remember one day he came to me as a young preacher and said, Brother Van Gelder, and he said, I don't understand this. He said, I spent time with God. I claimed the promises. Man, I claimed God was going to work. I got in that pulpit. I preached, and nothing happened. And I remember asking him this question. How do you know? And later he said that that impacted him. What I meant by that was simply this. If you've claimed the promises, then you don't have to see it in the experiential realm. Believe it because the promises are always true. <laughs> the idea is really what's in this particular passage. And I only learned that the hard way and still have to learn it. You've got to trust that God worked even though you don't necessarily see it or sense it. But the promises have been claimed. That's the idea. We're looking at the instrument panel, and I don't know about you, when I'm fogged in, I'm saying, God, would you lift the fog? God, I need you. God, I need your presence. But God, I'm expecting you to do it. I'm expecting you to lift the fog. And I will tell you, friend, when he lifts the fog and you experience the presence of God, the whole point is God is simply helping us recognize that what we're dealing with is a spiritual reality that has come because of the instrument panel. And at that moment, friends, literally we become channels of the presence of God. 
touching other lives. And I can honestly say that this, uh, can I say, say a couple things I won't just say in conclusion here. Often we talk about our Father, and I don't want to diminish Him or His ministry in any way because His impact was enormous in my life. But many times I, I realize, you know, I probably don't talk about my mother enough because she was equally impactful in my life. One of the reasons I'm bringing her up is because if she was still living, today would be her 96th birthday. 1989, a day before her 65th birthday, God chose to take her home to heaven. But there is no doubt in my life that I would not be here tonight if it was not for my mother. She, uh, because of growing up in a home where she was orphaned, that brought, as I think I've mentioned in some of the messages where we dealt with wounds, that brought some insecurity into her life. And I will tell you one of the things that I appreciated about my mother is she loved the instrument panel. If I were to bring her Bible to set it out in the lobby, you were to go by, it'd be just the way she did it. I, I, other people do it differently. Every, every part of the white page was gone. I mean, she had notes everywhere. She loved the instrument panel. And I will tell you, she so loved the instrument panel, I remember when I would preach a message, I would walk into her bedroom and I would see my preaching tapes next to her bed. I'm 23 years old. I'm 24 years old. I'm thinking to myself, Mom, you don't need to listen to that. She would ask me questions about the Bible. Pastor Van Gelden can tell you the same thing. Ask him questions about the Bible. When I would consider we were kids, and I believe with all my heart, she was absolutely sincere. You know why? She loved the instrument panel. Because it was the only thing that got her through, her mother dying at 9 and her father dying at 14. It was the instrument panel. There were a lot of times when Paul groaned into her life. She loved the instrument panel. She learned to believe on him. Trust him for leadership. And trust him for the grace to follow. Now, I remember many times in my mother's latter years, and of course, 65 is really young. I mean, it's really young. But I remember in those latter years, my mother often just musing on, look what God did. Little orphan girl out of central Illinois, look what God did. I'm going to tell you why. She loved the instrument panel. He that believeth on me. You get that? That's where faith comes by hearing. Out of, her, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And I've said this many times, but I will conclude with this. Uh, my dad's been in heaven for a long time, 1987, mom since 89. I cannot go six months, and I'm telling you right now, it's been within six months. I cannot go six months without somebody saying to me, either my mom, dad, or both, their ministry changed my life. I had one man tell me, he said, I didn't know your dad. I was never with your dad except for one time. He said, I, we got both got delayed in the airport. He said, I spent 45 minutes with your dad. He said, that 45 minutes changed my life. And I can guarantee you now, 45 minutes with no one can change your life, but 45 minutes with Jesus can. Rivers of living water. And friends, whatever sin issue you've struggled with, the answer is always the same. We need God. We've got to walk with God. We've got to know His reality. And then the very people who've been defeated in sin can now become channels of the presence of Jesus Christ. Wow. What a great truth. Can I ask every head bowed, please, and every eye closed? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Thank you so much for your good attention tonight. Do you just mind standing your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed? Just stand your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm just going to encourage you tonight, do whatever the Lord wants you to do, whatever that might be. In a moment, I will ask the pianist to play. Has it been a while since you met with God? Has it been a while since you got desperate? Has it been a while since you just got hungry and thirsty and said, God, I can't go on without you. I can't do it. Has it been a while? Maybe tonight an old-fashioned trip down to the front, getting on your knees and saying, God, uh, my thirst got dull. I need you tonight. I can't go on without you. I need you to show up. All of us need God all the time, but sometimes, you know, I don't know about you. I want to get to the point where I need God right now. He showed up yesterday, but I need Him again today. Sometimes we get, get a little relaxed and get dulled in our culture, and it's been a while. 
just a moment the piano will begin to play. And when that piano begins to play, I just encourage you, if God stirred your heart, you come, Neil, do business with God, college student, maybe some of you freshmen, God stirred you. Say, preacher, I don't even really know what it is to meet with God. Not only come and pray, but get with somebody who can help you uh, how to spend time with God and meet God. You're going to get some of that uh, information in the next few weeks anyway. But you can do, just do whatever God tells you to do as the piano plays. He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Expect it. God doesn't just bless some and bless others. No, He'll bless all. He's no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter if you're President of the United States. If you don't have a fellowship with Jesus Christ, you will not be fulfilled. Only Jesus can fulfill Rivers of living water. Not only are you fulfilled, you become a channel to touch and fulfill other lives with His presence. Wow. Just take a moment. Talk to God about it. Can you live without God? Hey, listen, if you're looking at garbage every day, you're not meeting with God. You need God. Still bowed before the Lord. Yes. Let's just take a moment as we stay standing. And if your heart right now is just yearning to meet with the Lord, why don't you tell Him you're thirsty? Why don't you tell Him that you need Him? And you want to be in His presence. Just a short prayer like that, out loud, if the Holy Spirit directs you. It, uh, all of us can identify with that, and if God's worked in your heart, let's just take a moment, and let's just, as a, as a group, cry out to the Lord to meet with us. He will, out of our belly, will flow rivers of living water. We have the Spirit of God in us. So let's go to the Lord here.